a sacred liturgical language that is the basis uh, and part of their claimed uh, power. So a thing not named in Latin has no existence in law. This is why they convert maxims, often created in English, um, in the middle of the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, and even 20th century, and convert them into Latin, because a thing not named in Latin has no existence. So in recognition of this, <clears throat> it wasn't good enough simply to, to issue things in pure English. We had to recognise that they would not even concede that these things exist unless they were written in Latin. So every canon has a Latin name and an English name. There are 22 books of canon law being issued. Uh, I'm completing the fourth book at the moment, the book of ecclesiastical law, but the first three books have already, already been issued and can be viewed on the site oneheaven.org. The first being the uh, book of divine law, uh, the second being uh, the canons of uh, natural law, and the third being the canons of positive law. Now, what is probably most relevant for, for most on the call is going to be, in this uh, immediate term, positive law. Uh, because when we talk about positive law, and this is uh, a definition of uh, what is positive law, Canon 667 of positive law. Positive law is the laws that are enacted by men and women through proper authority in accordance with these canons for the government of a society as positive law ultimately refers to physical objects and living beings, all valid positive law may be said to be derived from natural law. In other words, positive law are the laws made by men. That's merely what we mean by positive law. It's the laws made by men. So when we're talking about trusts, estates, taxes, foreclosures, liens, arrest, assess the KVs, these are all the laws made by men. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there is approximately 191 articles of positive law, and there is a lot there. I urge you all, if you haven't already, to begin from the beginning and read through, <clears throat> but there are going to be things that um, have an immediate interest to you based upon uh, your present situations and based upon the immediate things you may be finding uh, you're up against. So with all that introduction now, I'm about to dive into some of the canons that are listed in positive law relating to trusts, e-states, what is a SESTA KV trust exactly, and how these things are used against you in the most fundamental way. Now, if we end up having enough time, we'll, uh, what I'd like to do also is, is not speak for the entire period. I can only speak for two hours, but uh, towards the end, uh, certainly I want to ask uh, any of you, if you want to ask a question, um, please, I would be open to, to hearing your questions uh, and, and trying to answer them. So, and I spoke with Gary Ray, uh, if we find ourselves running short, I hope um, the opportunity exists for me to return and continue into some of the other areas like taxes, mortgages, foreclosures. But given the time, I just want to focus on those things. So before we get into trusts and start with trusts, we need to start with what is a trust used for and to talk about property what actually is property and the very nature of ownership of property. Otherwise, trusts are not clear. So I'm now referring to Article 80, property, and Canon 1114, the definition of property. So please excuse me if I read some of these out directly, but again, it, it may help you if you're reading it. it. These definitions are pretty clear. So in Canon 1114, what we say is property is any fictional right of use expressed into a trust relationship with other forms whereby there exists a claimed form of ownership, 
form of trustees administering the form as property and forms of beneficiaries. Hence, property is the rights of owner to use the form, never ownership of the object or concept itself. Okay, so what we're saying here is property uh, as we believe it and we are taught it is the concept or the object. That's how they uh, teach us uh, what property is. Really, what property is, is it's the right of use. Now, the best way to understand this, and we're getting a bit of uh, static there, someone's not muted. Um, uh, just check, people, if you've got mute there, because there is a bit of feedback there in the call. Um, what, we're, what we're saying is that property is not what we think it is. It is not the object or concept. It is the right to use the object or concept. That's what property is. It's the right of use. Now, how does this come to be, and why do they use this uh, trick on us in, in convincing us that the property is the thing and not the right to use the thing? Well, the reason for that is actually what a right is and what ownership is. If you look at the canons of natural law, or you were to look at a physics book, I assure you, you will never find a law of physics, a law of the universe, which says that you can own another person as a slave, or that someone else can own you as a slave. In fact, you will not find a single physical law, natural law, that says you can own anything. You can own nothing. There is no law of ownership in the universe. None. Okay? So, in the uh, 14th century, when the Roman cult, or 30, end of the 13th century, when the Roman cult really started to think about how do we end up controlling the world, they struck upon this realisation that, yes, um, people had been enslaved for thousands and sometimes hundreds of years and yes, kings have controlled great empires and risen and fallen. In all cases, it was through the use of absolute force and fear and might that those civilizations functioned. There was no underlying principle of law as we would view it in terms of property. It was merely might is right, an eye for an eye. So uh, when they realized this concept they realise something that we, sh we too need to understand. There is only one entity, one being, uh, that can own anything in theory, and that is the divine creator. We, living within the universe, within the dream of existence, can own nothing. So the only owner, ultimately, that can legitimately claim ownership rights of objects and concepts is the divine creator. All right. Well, if the divine creator is the only owner, how then does property come into being? How then does rights come into being? And what's the relevance then of trusts? Well, <clears throat> it's all linked. It's all connected. And it all comes back to what they did in 1302 with Unum Sanctum, the first express trust, one of the only legitimate papal bulls you'll ever see. Well, if the divine creator is the only owner, then if you can claim to be the only spokesperson for the divine creator, then you ultimately can say that the rights of the divine are conveyed to you and then you control where those rights are conveyed. That is the nature of rights. Rights being top-down. Property rights being top-down. It begins with the divine, then next down is the highest authority of the divine on the earth, and then the next down from that are those that that divine authority um, convey certain rights to, and so it trickles down, eventually to the slaves tilling the field or the man and the woman uh, that wishes to have their own home. And that is the modern system of property rights created in 1302 and subsequently refined until the present day. That is exactly the system we live under. 
Everything in the world is controlled by property. Everything in the world is controlled by rights, and everything in the world comes back to this basic system. Everything, whether they're Chinese, Russian, Burmese, American, Australian, Canadian, it's the same system across the planet. That is the essence of property. All right, with that in mind, uh, let's now have a look at uh, trusts. So I hope that was uh, clear. And I'm, I'm mindful I'm covering things very quickly, uh, but I, I, I hope that's clear. So <clears throat> we have a right, a right of use. But it wasn't good enough for the Roman cult to simply come up with uh, a right. It needed some legal form that turned that into something real. Because we're talking about a fiction, a right of use. They needed to give it a, le a level of reality to such the point that it had value, it had consistency, um, it could be protected and couldn't be corrupted. So for that, they created the concept of the trust. The trust is the container in which property is conveyed. So property, as you saw in the definition of property, never travels anywhere without a trust. And I might just go back to property for a second and just quickly cover some of those uh, definitions. Um, so, Canon 1117, property cannot exist in reality without an owner, at least one trustee, at least one beneficiary. So, property can't exist without a trust. Form not expressed into trust by some lawful conveyance does not exist in reality as property. So, here, by understanding property as a right from the top down, we see that trusts and property are intimately involved. Property is the thing placed in a trust. A trust cannot exist without property. With this in mind, I go back to, to trust being Article 84 of trust. Again, apologise for reading, but uh, these are canons that you will see, I'm sure, when you go. So Canon 1147, trust. A trust is a fictional form of relationship and agreement whereby certain form, rights, rights being property, and obligations are lawfully conveyed to the control of one or more persons as administrators for the benefit of one or, or more other persons. And then we go into what a trust needs to have in order to uh, be a valid trust. <clears throat> and I will go through these because these are the essential elements of what makes a trust a trust. So Canon 1148, all valid trusts possess the following characteristics known as the standard characteristics of trust. By the way, these are the same characteristics uh, of the uh, conventions um, of The Hague and are universally recognised by the Roman system as being the essential elements of a trust. One, a trust instrument, also known as a trust deed, identifying the essential form of the trust, the property to be conveyed to create the trust, and how the trust shall be administered. And two, an owner of the property or authorised person having the permission to create the trust instrument and convey the form of property in the trust in the first place. Three, a collection of property within the trust defined as the trust corpus, also as the trust body, or the body corporate. Now, when we speak about e-states uh, in a moment, an e-state, in fact, is the body corporate of a testamentary trust. So that's where the word e-state comes in. An e-state is nothing more than a dead body corporate given that a testamentary trust is created for a deceased uh, grantor. Someone dies, a testamentary trust then is given life. Four, at least one administrator of the trust, also known as the trustee, who is neither the owner nor authorised person who conveyed the property into the trust, appointed in accordance with the trust instrument, who is then responsible for the administration of the assets of the trust, being the corpus, also been the collection of property. Now, I know that there has been an enormous amount of disinformation 
that has come out 